Hey there Gators and welcome back for another unit of material. So for this uh, video we're going to talk about states of consciousness. So as always we'll start out with our student learning outcomes. You can review what we'll discuss here in this unit. But it's always good to start with that definition of what we'll talk about. So for consciousness we're talking about our awareness of internal as well as external stimuli. So internal stimuli are things like pain and hunger and thirst. External stimuli are things that are outside of us, like the light we get from the sun or how warm our room is. So internal is, is states that are inside of us, external is states that are outside of us. And our consciousness is our awareness of those states. So there's a lot of altered states of consciousness that we'll talk about. We're going to talk about sleep for a while, as well as talking about intoxication and drugs and meditation, hypnosis. So some of these um, altered consciousness states occur spontaneously. Others are induced by either psychological or physiological states. We're going to spend some time first kind of talking about biological rhythms. So this is important for our discussion of sleep. But we have a lot of internal kind of rhythms of our body. So our body, as the, time, as the day goes on, we see changes in our temperature, our body temperature, our hormone levels. We see changes in menstrual cycles as the month goes on. In sleep wake, we have all they have different, um, you know, sort of circadian rhythms or shifts in our sleep and wake cycles, and things like heart rate and blood pressure. So if you measure even something like pain tolerance in the morning, it's going to be different than pain tolerance in the afternoon. So it's these internal shifts, and our body tries to really maintain balance. So even though we do have some of these shifts, our body tries to keep us relatively within the same general area of um, of functioning. And so this is called homeostasis. Our circadian rhythms I've kind of mentioned, but these are what takes place over a period of a day or about 24 hours. The sleep-wake cycle is one that's often mentioned with our circadian rhythms. It's related to the natural light and dark cycle. If you've ever been camping and you realize that you start to go to bed a little earlier, wake up a little earlier, your body's really adjusting to that light-dark cycle. Um, our hypothalamus is what helps us to make this actually happen, especially a part of the brain that we call the SCN, super suprachiasmatic nucleus, I probably just butchered that, but the SCN of our hypothalamus is our brain's clock that kind of helps us maintain these circadian rhythms. And our pineal gland is what's going to release melatonin. You may have taken melatonin for helping you sleep, but we also release melatonin naturally. And this is something that's when it's dark, it's stimulated. When we have light in front of our faces, it's inhibited. So this can be important when we think about things like using our cell phone or TV before bed. Um, it's going to kind of inhibit that melatonin. We've got a lot of examples of circadian rhythms. So um, you can see the peaks kind of here, so our peak mental alertness, alertness is around 9 a.m., 9 p.m. So um, we often have most difficulty in the afternoon. So our peak degree of sleepiness around 3 p.m., we really see that happen, I know I do. But you can kind of review these um, peaks and valleys here for our circadian rhythms. I mentioned our SCN before. So with this, it is that brain's clock mechanism. It's super important. It really relies on the retina of the eye to help set itself with light. So we have a lot of problems that can occur with circadian rhythms, many of which you probably experienced. So if you've ever, um, you know, if you live in Virginia and you fly to California, you might experience what we call jet lag, which is this period of where you have trouble sleeping, you feel kind of sluggish, irritable, exhausted, and it's from kind of having that shift forward um, or backward, depending on where you travel, in your circadian rhythm. If you work shift work, you can end up seeing issues with circadian rhythms. So um, if you have to stay up all night as a nurse and, and kind of help deliver babies, um, this can really kind of wreak havoc on the body. So it can lead to mistakes at work, depression, anxiety, some physical health um, concerns, especially if you're not getting enough sleep. So shift work is important. It's something we need in our society, but we have to help minimize those issues associated with it. Individuals who are blind can experience issues with their melatonin, their circadian rhythms, due to not receiving that light information from the natural environment. And when we don't get enough sleep, we experience a lot of issues. So we'll talk some more about some of these issues, but it can cause a sleep debt. So that's almost like this time is adding up, like you have to pay a debt to somebody. You kind of have to pay a debt to yourself with sleep. If you keep missing all of this sleep, it helps us, or if we don't get enough sleep, then we can feel um, less alert, we can feel slow and sluggish. Light therapies can help. So actually plugging in something that will give you that feeling of light can sometimes help. It's um, not just any light bulbs, but you can get actual light bulbs that give off those same kind of UV rays that you get from the sun. So are you getting the sleep you need? This is probably, um, for many of us, no. 
but hopefully yes. So um, 18 and older, we would expect to get around 7 to 9. If you start getting um, so much, you know, kind of less and less sleep than that, then you start running into health issues. So if you have sleep deprivation, you're not getting enough sleep, this can cause um, system-wide problems with your, um, with your body. So it can affect the heart, it can affect reaction times, immune system, it can affect um, the brain, so you can be more irritable, have more trouble with memory. So it's something that's really, really important. Um, you know, we need to get enough sleep. It can also affect us while driving. So driving tired or driving fatigued can be just as bad as driving buzz, um, you know, from using substances. So it's really, really important. Um, we're going to talk some about sleep and how we measure sleep. So we measure sleep by using what we call an EEG. So it's this electroencephalography, I can't, I can't speak today, um, but our EEG, we'll just go with that. Um, yeah, so our, our EEG, we end up putting electrodes on someone's scalp. So you can see a picture there of someone who has a nice, um, a nicer version, a uh, more advanced version of an EEG. So these electrodes then record the brain's activity, and we're able to see then when people are actually sleeping to look at the brain waves that they're giving off. So sleep is characterized then by low levels of physical activity, reduced sensory awareness. We all know what it looks like when someone's asleep, but we can view that sleep on a brainwave basis. We spend a lot of our life sleeping. So why do we sleep? If we spend so much of our life doing it, it has to have a real function. But an interesting thing about sleep is that even though we spend so much of our time doing it, we have a lot of mysteries where we're just not sure about certain functions of sleep. We have a lot of hypotheses, though, so we know there are likely some adaptive functions, so things like restoring your resources. Um, you know, we know that it has bad consequences if you don't get enough, so it must have some kind of adaptive functioning. Um, you know, if we look back to our evolutionary past, we also had more predators coming at us at night, and so it helped to be asleep and kind of away from the natural environment. Um, we also know sleep has major cognitive functions, so it helps us organize cognition and memory and attention to detail and judgment and decision making. It helps us to remember new tasks that we've learned. So if you don't get enough sleep, you end up having effects on the body and the brain. So we have multiple stages of sleep. With stages one and two, we'll talk about these, but this is more of a light sleep. If you're awoken during these stages, you might not even report that you were asleep. Stages three and four, our sleep is deeper, and then REM sleep is when we're actually dreaming. So it's rapid eye movement sleep. So our early stages, um, well, this is actually when we're awake. So um, kind of thinking of sleep stages, if we measure, if we put that EEG cap on, we measure electro electrical activity when someone's awake and alert, we see these um, fast, irregular beta waves. So you can kind of see what that looks like here. If you're awake but relaxed, so you kind of close your eyes, but you're awake, then we can see more of these alpha waves. We also see these when people are meditating. During our sleep stages one and two, we start seeing theta waves. So with these individuals, kind of these early stages of sleep, um, we're, you know, they might say they weren't even asleep if you wake them up, and we can really start to see theta waves in their rest. We can also see things called sleep spindles or K-complexes. So with our sleep spindles, you can kind of see that burst of activity in that, in that picture there for stage two sleep, but it may be important, we think, for learning and memory. For the K-complexes, um, we think this might occur when there's environmental stimuli that kind of um, gets in as, um, as the person is starting to go to sleep. With stages three and four, these are our deeper sleep stages. So brain activity slows down. We start to see delta waves, less likely to, um, to be awoken by external stimuli. So we can kind of start seeing this, this period of deep and restful sleep. REM sleep is really, really important stage of sleep. So with this, although the brain is, or although the person is asleep, we actually start to see those beta waves again. So it looks like the person is more awake or aroused. We see more of the peaks and valleys, and especially during this phase where our eyes will move back and forth, um, then we start to see more of this, uh, these peaks and valleys in our brain waves, these beta waves. So um, during this REM sleep cycle, REM sleep stage is when we actually do our dreaming. So we often report these vivid dreams. If you were to go in and actually do a sleep study, you'd be able to get results like these. So you'd be able to see the patterns of your brain, um, the awake stage looking more like that REM sleep stage. Um, and we can start to see some of this sleep spindles or K-complexes if you look at that stage two sleep. So um, we can actually read one sleep using that EEG and understand what stages they're going to um, experience as well as what we might expect from those stages. We have 90 minute cycles during our sleep. 
And so with each of these 90 minute cycles, our stage three and four sleep, that deep sleep, starts to decrease. So we experience less and less of that. And the amount of time we spend in REM increases. So as the night goes on, we spend more and more our time in that dreaming state, in that dumb deep REM state sleep. There's a lot of really cool facts about REM, um, REM sleep. So that's what is the feel rested sleep. If you're deprived of REM, then you can go right into REM rebound. So the next time you go to sleep, you actually start getting into REM much quicker. Um, so we need that REM sleep to feel rested. If you're woken up right before you hit REM, um, you know, if you're in a sleep study and they, they do that to you, wake you up before you hit REM, you're not going to feel like you got restful sleep. Uh, we all have very active dreams. Our bodies are just paralyzed. Uh, men can achieve full erections during sleep, and some of our medications will actually suppress REM, and so that can be a big issue then, too, with not feeling rested. So there's a lot of really cool stuff that goes on with REM sleep. So our dreams. We've kind of mentioned dreams um, a couple times now, so do they actually mean anything? So Freud thought that our dreams were the royal road to the unconscious. So he thought we had manifest content, which was on the surface of the dream, so whatever you actually dreamed about, and then we had latent content, and that was what the dream really meant. So you might have a dream, like this picture suggests, of carrots, and the carrots are coming down, and they're impacting you as you're, as you're running through fields. And Freud would then say, the carrots represent um, the penis, and you're afraid of the penis. So um, he would say this would you know, teach us about our unconscious. Carl Jung thought this helped us to tap into this collective unconscious, so kind of this experience that we all share as human beings, this deep unconsciousness that really is rel relative to all of us. Um, Cartwright thought our dreams reflect important life events. Hobson thought that they were virtual reality experiences that help us to navigate the wakeful world. So it's a lot of really interesting ideas as to what functions dream ha dreams have, what they mean for us. Um, some people are capable of something called lucid dreaming. So with lucid dreaming, you know you're dreaming and you can control your dreams. So this can take practice. People who want to lucid dream can actually go through certain processes to help them learn how to lucid dream. So you'd be able to recognize the fact that you are in a dream and then make active changes within that dream. So it can be pretty interesting, but people can also report that it's scary. And that brings us into our sleep disorders. So for sleep disorders, we're going to talk about insomnia. We're going to talk about parasomnias, and there's a bunch of different parasomnias we'll discuss. And then sleep apneas, and briefly SIDS, and briefly narcolepsy. So we'll get right into insomnia. Insomnia is the most common sleep disorder, so many people have experienced insomnia before. This is when you have trouble either falling asleep or staying asleep. And then you can have that feeling like you're anxious about going to sleep, so you're afraid that you won't get to sleep, and you start thinking, oh, if I go to sleep now, I'll get six hours. I go to sleep now, I get five hours. And so sometimes that anxiety feeling will actually keep you awake. So that can be a big issue with insomnia. We can treat insomnia with multiple different ways. So one is sleep hygiene. So with this, it's the two S's. So they say, save your bedroom then for sleep and sex. So don't um, watch movies in it. Don't do your homework in it. Don't eat burritos in it. You know, really save it for sleep or for sex. Um, we can also treat insomnia with medications as well as therapy. There's a bunch of different types of parasomnias, so we'll cover some of the most, um, some of the ones that are the most uh, common or most interesting to, to kind of teach us about sleep. So with parasomnias, we have things like sleepwalking as well as sleep talking, sleep eating, sleep sex, sleep violence. Uh, we also have things called night terrors, and um, we'll get into each of these a little bit. REM sleep behavior disorder, leg re restlessness, and then some of these periodic limb movement disorder. So um, what these are, what these parasomnias are, are these disruptions in our motor activity or our experiences during sleep. They're triggered by um, sleep deprivation or stress or pregnancy or tranquilizers. So um, each of these can occur for many different reasons. Um, a big one that we'll cover is REM behavior disorder. So um, just to mention, um, we're getting right into REM sleep behavior disorder there. So sleep walking, talking, eating, sex, violence, a lot of those are just when people actually experience um, these things like talking to other people or going to the cupboard and eating a bunch of crackers while they're actually asleep. And then night terrors are things we can experience, um, often as young kids who experience these, but it's um, they're actually asleep, but they have this fear or terror feeling. They might wake up screaming from a deep sleep. Um, they don't appear to be awake at all. They're not awake. Um, they don't often don't remember having that kind of horrible nightmare looking event with this night terror in the morning. 
So that's our night terrors. Um, REM sleep behavior disorder is what we we're about to talk about. And with this, we have this failure of the brain then to suppress those voluntary actions during REM sleep. So the person will actively respond to their dream story. So normally their dream story is something where they feel like they're being attacked and they'll actively act out that feeling. So they might punch a partner, they might get up and start fighting. Um, this typically occurs in men, older men, and it is something that's chronic and it keeps getting worse. So many times if you have a partner with this REM behavior disorder, they're not able to sleep in the same bed because the partner will keep getting beaten up. Um, sleep apnea, make sure we covered everything we needed there. Yes, so we'll talk about um, sleep apnea, but um, leg restlessness is a feeling that, just to make sure we cover all these, leg restlessness is a feeling that your um, legs are kind of um, unable to stop moving during the night, so they feel like they are... Um, irritated, they are pulsating, they have these negative feelings, um, uncomfortable feelings as you try to rest and you feel like you can't get them to calm down. So that can be something that keeps people awake. And then our periodic limb movement disorder, you can experience that as um, people will move their limbs or their limbs are not paralyzed as they typically would be in sleep. So let's bring us back into sleep apnea. So with sleep apnea, we actually see this partial blockage of the airway. So people will um, stop breathing, they'll have loud snoring, um, they can experience shortness of breath. So we can actually, this is actually something very dangerous for people to experience. And it can cause a lot of symptoms in the daytime. So um, it can cause things like just you know, feeling sleepy, but it can also exacerbate things like heart disease. You know, you're actually stopping breathing during the night with some of these forms of sleep apnea. And it can happen over and over during the night. And so that's really impactful for our oxygen and our overall health. So sleep apnea then is something that needs to be treated. And there's a lot of ways to treat that. So this shows a CPAP therapy. So it's the machine mask that the person will wear that helps to keep their um, head in the proper, uh, proper position so that they can continue to breathe. They don't experience those um, shortness of breath or, or um, episodes where they stop breathing. You can also have devices made by a dentist, things like surgeries to help clear if there's some kind of obstruction, and then um, weight loss can often help. So people who are obese experience sleep apnea more often than those who are, who are not obese. Sudden infant death syndrome is a really unfortunate occurrence that it can happen to, to um, typically infants under the year of age. And this is when they'll stop breathing during sleep and they'll pass away. Um, so kind of risk factors for this, many times it does just happen, so we don't really understand exactly what occurred, what the problem was, but we do know that being premature, uh, having smokers in the home, and then being overheated can be problems. So we try to avoid those to reduce the risk of SIDS, as well as putting the baby on the back to sleep. So it's a campaign that was saying, you know, um, back to sleep, tummy to play. So we'll put the baby on the back while they sleep, and then while they're awake and playing, put them on their tummy. And that way, um, that helps, that's been found to help reduce the rate of SIDS. And then also leaving nothing in the crib. So no crib bumpers, no stuffed animals, no pillows, nothing the baby can suffocate on. So just a flat mattress um, for the baby to rest on, and that should be perfectly sufficient for them and helps reduce those risks of SIDS. Narcolepsy is a disorder where people have this irresistible urge to fall asleep. Oftentimes it's associated with a muscle weakness or um, kind of a, a paralyzed muscle. Um, these people will enter the REM sleep very quickly. It can happen out of nowhere. You can have someone talking to you and then fall into a REM sleep state. Um, we treat this with medication, but it has a really big impact on people's lives. So sometimes people won't be able to drive um, or do other tasks because they're in danger for falling asleep. And there's a, um, you know, an example of narcolepsy looked into this, uh, this slide here with a dog who experiences narcolepsy. So it is just kind of this irresistible urge to fall asleep and the falling asleep kind of randomly um, you know, just spontaneously. And that brings us into drugs. So we won't spend a ton of times on time on drugs, but you can see here um, these de depictions of antipsychotics, stimulants, depressants, hallucinogens, and kind of uh, many of these types of drugs that we'll talk about. So just some terms when talking about drugs. We're talking about things that alter our consciousness, and they ex you can experience certain things with these drugs. So physical dependence is something that your body actually changes its function. You can experience withdrawal or terrible symptoms after you stop using the drug. Psychological dependence is when you have more of an emotional need for that drug. Tolerance is when you require more and more of the drug to achieve the effects you used to achieve. So maybe you only needed one cigarette to feel a little bit better initially, but now you smoke two or three before you feel a little bit more calm. 
And then withdrawal are these symptoms that we experience once the drug is discontinued. So if you were addicted to something like cocaine, stop using it, you might experience a period of withdrawal where your body adjusts to life without that drug. There's a lot of classes of drugs that we'll briefly mention. We have depressants, and these are called depressants because they do suppress that central nervous system activity. Alcohol is a um, common depressant. Stimulants increase that level of neural activity. This is things like cocaine or caffeine. Opioids really reflect pain relief, so they have these same properties as some of our natural pain relievers. This is things like heroin and morphine. Hallucinogens really alter our perception of um, the world around us. This is things like LSD, PCP. And then finally, we have marijuana, which um, many people are familiar with. So some, in some states, it's legal to use marijuana. In other states, it's still not. But um, this can lead to euphoric feelings as well as um, some negative feelings of paranoia and things like that. That brings us into hypnosis. With hypnosis, we're talking about this state of self-focus and self-attention. So you're not really paying a lot of attention to external stimuli. Um, many times this is a social interaction where you'll have one person um, who's the hypnotist kind of say to the other that um, they're going to experience certain feelings or thoughts or behaviors and that these experiences should kind of spontaneously occur. So many times it is this social interaction. So the participant, the person who's being hypnotized, will be guided to focus on something like words or a ticking watch. They'll told to be make themselves comfortable, to feel relaxed, to feel sleepy, to have trust in the hypnotist and encouraged to use their imagination. So when we try to understand what happens with hypnosis, it seems like there's a couple theories as to what it could be. So it could be something like a disassociation. So you're kind of um, pulling yourself out of that normal realm of consciousness. It could also be something where we have a social role to fill. So we act as we're expected to act. So if um, we're expected to act in like, um, you know, in a sleepy manner, in a calm manner, then we just do so. So it could be something in our mind, it could be something socially, but we do know that hypnosis can have some benefits for people who choose to engage in it. So it can be used for things like um, pain, depression, anxiety, and can also help people even with things like smoking or weight loss. So hypnosis does have some important um, aspects to it, and we're talking about with hypnosis more of a relationship between a hypnotist and a participant. So we don't have to have someone um, you know, kind of having this done within a clinical setting. Sometimes you can see this in an entertainment setting. So with stage hypnosis, this is a little bit different. So this is more of a simulation of hypnosis and it's achieved by certain things. So the stage hypnotist will be the star of the show. They will um, look for people who are suggestible, who are willing to participate, who look responsive to the activity. Um, kind of labeling something as hypnosis disinhibits people, so they lose that sense of inhibition that they would normally possess. And then sometimes the person will use tricks. So it's not exactly the same thing as hypnosis that occurs between a, like a therapist and a client. It's instead using more of these kind of tricks or simulations of hypnosis. It brings us to our final topic, which is meditation. So with meditation, we don't need an external party like a hypnotist. With meditation, this is something you can do on your own. And so with this, we use these mental exercises to kind of alter our consciousness. So we might focus attention on something like the present, which is what we do in mindfulness meditation. Try to focus all of your attention on present thoughts, feelings, sensations, and kind of being um, present there and removing that flow of thoughts and worries that you might otherwise have. Meditation can have a lot of great things happen for people. It can have a lot of great Im impact. For individuals so it can reduce things like pain, um, can reduce some substance abuse, can re reduce some cortisol in the blood, it can help um, improve our mood and mental efficiency, alertness, so it's got a ton of different ways to kind of or um, effects on the body and the mind so it can be something really good to try if you want to. Um, and then sensory deprivation is kind of in line with meditation but a little bit different. So for this, we're just kind of depriving our senses of that normal amount of information that they would get. So things like light and sound, uh, we typically get a certain amount of that and in this case we would kind of be reducing that stimuli. So for brief periods of reducing all of your sensory information, this can be relaxing. Um, but for kind of, if you do it for longer or if it's a more intense experience, then people can have hallucinations or delusions. Um, after this period of sensory deprivation, many people will report feeling that their senses are um, increased, 
and it can help them to reduce bad habits. Well, that finishes material for Chapter 4 on states of consciousness. So we discussed sleep as well as drugs and meditation and kind of these different ways that we are um, aware of or not aware of our surroundings. I'll talk to you again soon, Gators. Bye.